This is Internet Marketing. Hello and welcome to the Internet Marketing Podcast brought to you by Site Visibility. I'm your host, Scott Colnutt, and with me today is Daniel Cooper, Managing Director at Lollico. We're going to be discussing simple ways to start with business automation, a topic that's very close to my heart and I'm very curious about. So I'm really looking forward to this episode. So welcome to the podcast, Daniel. Thanks very much, Scott. Really excited to be here today. Oh, excellent. And uh, before we go into all the details of business automation and workflow automation and software and all that fun stuff, do you want to take a moment to introduce yourself to our listeners? Feel free to share a little bit about your background and any missions you're on at Lollico. Sure. So uh, I am a business process and automation consultant, really. Uh, I work with a number of clients all around the world. And together with the other consultants at Lollico and our automation engineers, we delve deep into companies to really help them discover where the inconsistencies uh, and the wasteful parts of these business processes lie, uh, and then apply technology, whether or not that's what we would refer to as simple automation, whether or not it's machine learning or whether or not it's actual robotics, in order to lift and improve their bottom line and allow their staff to get back to doing all the stuff that's fun which is actually interaction with other humans. My own background is in originally uh, finance, uh, but I've been a computer programmer since I was quite young. And my passion is actually, as you would imagine, automating things. Uh, <laughs> I get a real uh, kick out of it. Um, it's just a, I, I really, it's really quite wonderful to see automation come into the, into the business world and into real life and, and get a kick out of that. So that's, that's wonderful. And our, our actual mission at Lolly uh, is to automate a million companies. This is our big aim. I have to start there because I saw that one million customers and your big aim. And I just wanted to know, you know, where does that come from? Where does that million figure come from? Is that a scientific estimation or is that a guess or just an ambition? Well, uh, within our company, the, the, the engineers will often roll their eyes because I've always say that if someone came to us next week and said, I need to launch a satellite into space that's going to be automated in six months' time, I would say, absolutely, let's get it done. And I'm a big believer in you know, what you really aim for, you can do. And people can really achieve pretty much anything they set their hearts on. And I think you've got to have big, audacious goals. And I think a million companies, that is a big goal. And that really takes our business, some real rethinking of our own business processes and our own automation internally uh, to allow us to do that. So it's, it's quite a good way for me as a business leader to focus the entire team to think about scale. And then that only helps us further to apply it to our own clients. You spoke there about being a computer engineer and in your upcoming book upgrade in the intro, uh, I, I was reading about you talk about taking computers back together, uh, sorry, taking computers apart and putting them back together as a child. And there's one line, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's about the exam train is leaving and you're, you're not on it. And um, that really made me smile. And it made me think about, has there been a recent trigger that led you to focus full time on automation? Because it seems like that's been something of interest to you since you've been a child. But looking at your career, you've really doubled down in that area over the last couple of years. So was there anything that just triggered that change? Absolutely. I think I'm a bit of a rogue, really. So I think what you describe in there, if anyone's going to pick up the book, you'll, you'll read about this in there. But the, the story that Scott's describing is when I decided that actually I was just going to try and well, cheat my math GCSE and automate the entire process by putting everything into the calculator. It's like a Casio uh, that you could basically program. They, they bought us the calculators. It wasn't technically cheating. Uh, and I will probably lose my math GCC, but I'm not really overly bothered at this point. It's too late for all that. But yeah, I, I think for me, there was a, a real point in that. I, I'd actually been running a, a SaaS startup. So it was a software startup that was VC backed. And we really just ran out of runway. Uh, and we ended up closing the company down. And, and ironically, now looking at COVID, it, it would have really shut it anyway. But I ended up working as CTO for a, for a large medical clinic. And over time, I became, as a terrible employee, which I am, I became frustrated and just bored 
So I started automating my job. And it just got to the point where probably 50 or 60% of my job was automated. And in the end, I started realizing, well, hang on a minute, rather than just doing something along these lines where I can just you know put my feet up and take it easy and just pop out to lunch three times a day, maybe we could actually start applying this to other businesses and, and really start consulting people on it. And that's really where the journey began. Uh, and, and that was back in March 2019. So here we are just over two years later. And can you remember thinking back the tasks that you were automating as part of your job? Are you allowed to reveal that? <laughs> I mean, a lot of it was producing like data reports, you know, what's right. happening with this, what's happening with that. Um, so at first it would take hours and hours and hours to generate these reports, you know, going into SQL and figuring it all out and putting it all into Google Data Studio, whatever we were doing. Um, and, and in the end, we just, yeah, just automated it like that, really. Um, it was just heavy, heavy reporting and monitoring of tasks, which just really gets you after a while. I'm not a big believer in the mundane. I don't think humans should really have to do those jobs. So yeah, that's that's the direction it went really for that. But the, I think the big turning point was whilst I'd automated a large position of, the, of my role there, I was approached by someone who I'd known a few years before, actually, and it was, it was a financial firm and they came to me and they said, oh, you know, we really want to you know, do X, Y, and Z. Uh, in, in automation so i actually admittedly just said the biggest number i could think of that i thought sounded a bit stupid because i just wasn't really interested i was rather at that point pop out to lunch three times a day and most surprised to me they said yeah go on then that, that sounds that sounds good perfect that's definitely less money than we're spending on these three people who are doing that task again reveal whatever you can and if you can't answer some of these questions that's completely fine do let me know but i'm interested to know so when you start maybe automating a role like that in a previous job like you said, sometimes you can kind of just get away with it in some environments. And and I'm just interested to know, did, uh, did other colleagues or peers or bosses ever realize that you were automating so much of your job? And did they then take the opportunity to figure out what you were doing so that you could improve those companies that you were working in? Or did it just very naturally turn into this thing where you thought, do you know what, I have a, you know, you were motivated then to build what now is Lollygo? Sure. I mean, whilst I'm automating parts of my own position, there were things within the company that would frustrate me as well that other people were doing uh, that just seemed ever so wasteful. So we'd automate that, you know, and then on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and then providing levels of transparency across the business through, through data and recording what's happening there. Um, so there were some large parts of automation that they ended up, you know, having injected into the company, and it, it's resulted for them anyway uh, in really what was quite a digital transformation for that business. Because every business is different, whether or not it's our company, whether or not it's yours or anyone is listening, every business has its unique uh, craziness, I suppose, is the best way of doing it. And nothing that you select off of the shelf is ever going to be perfect for your business. And we all have this problem. And it's, we're trying to cobble stuff together all the time to get something that just about works. Well, that's where this kind of custom automation comes in, where it can be absolutely perfect for the business processes that are there Mm. there's something else that really stands out to you and it's not specific to automation it's more i think just generally good career and life advice and you were just talking about you know you were spotting opportunities for automation in your existing job trying to take care of the mundane or trivial things as you started to get these processes into place you took a step back and thought well actually rather than doing this as a necessity as part of my job, I could just turn this into a bigger thing. And for me, I've talked about this on the podcast before, and it's something I talk about at Site Visibility a lot. It's about coming to work and playing to your strengths and recognizing where your strengths and interests are, and then turning and then really following that path, because I think that's where you get the most satisfaction. Is it fair to say that you've kind of done that, and then you're getting a lot of satisfaction now out of Lollico, and that's really where your heart is? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it shows in the results that clients get. And I think clients are often surprised as well by the the route that we take. So traditionally, with a, if you went to a development studio and said, or an agency and said, look, we want to develop X, Y, or Z, they say, okay, great, we'll get to work. And there's no question of whether or not that's the right thing. I actually take great joy <laughs> in saying to my clients, no, that that is not the right thing to be doing. Why are you doing this? Uh, and examining in those processes uh, and, and only really automating what is right for them. And I think that's quite refreshing for our clients and it's more enjoyable for us because we know then that the work we do results in one of two things. That's either going to increase their bottom line, so their margins are higher, 
or it's going to actually bring in more money. So the revenue is going to increase. And if it doesn't really tick one of two boxes, then we're just not going to do it because what's the point for anyone, right? Thinking back to when you were learning these skills, applying these automation techniques to your roles, I'm thinking here that you come from a computer engineering background, and so you're clearly very technically savvy anyway. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking about my knowledge of automation and the fact that you don't have to be a computer engineer or computer scientist to understand automation and workflow automation. And that's one of the beautiful things about automation in 2021 as we're talking is there are so many off-the-shelf solutions available that make starting to get into automation a breeze. And I'm sure we'll get into that. Over the years, as you've been learning automation techniques, processes, and skills, what resources have been most useful for you? Is it just something that you tend to do on the job and or have you sought actual courses or training that have been useful on your journey? I think the actual, the biggest resource that I and everyone else at, at Lolly have gone through, and I would suggest anyone else do, would actually be to go onto Amazon and order every single book you can find on business processes. You will be bored to tears after a month. However, you will make your business sing. Uh, and that is the true art form of automation. It's not the technical nature of how it's done, whether or not that's through code that you've created for custom or whether or not that's off the shelf that you've mentioned uh, a minute or two ago, Scott. But it's actually in what is right for the business uh, and actually really optimum to making it really drive forwards at a fast pace. And that's the way to do it. No one really particularly needs, I don't believe, any type of qualification in order to be able to do something. Technically not a maths GCC either. But the point, <laughs> the point being is that I'm a big believer in actually you can go out there and you can really improve your business without having to go off and study whatever it might be that you think is deemed necessary often uh, is just resistance within yourself rather to do the task you just rather you know go out there and perhaps do an entire degree or master's or phd which for some people is the right thing for others especially running a business possibly not i've been thinking about coming into this about lolly co and that one million target customers and how you reach that goal. And another thing with automation that's striking to me is that, as you've just said, you should never seek automation for automation's sake. But I generally think that most businesses have a place for automation. And though you need the skills to identify where automation is going to be most useful, automation and what you offer is applicable to businesses big and small. So from a marketing perspective, I'm really interested to know, how do you decide at Lollico who to target? Because it's such a broad service that you offer that is applicable to so many different types and sizes of business. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Uh, and one, I think that's one that we ask ourselves a lot. In the very early days of business, you'll take whatever you can. And everyone's the same because you need to bring something through the door uh, to pay your mortgage, to feed the kids and you're lucky to have any staff to also make sure you're paying their mortgage and feeding their kids but over time as your business grows then you really need to start to build up profiles on who are your target audience now for us we are primarily only interested in working with small to medium-sized businesses if tesco came to us and said we want you to automate x y and z the reality of it is whilst it seems like a great opportunity really it can be quite a hindrance to you because suddenly you'll start running into, well, yes, you can send us your invoice from Lodico, but we actually only pay three months later or six months later. And this is what we deem would need to be X, Y, and Z deliverable. Uh, you will need this ISO accreditation. You start heading into some real hurdles there. Uh, and actually, it becomes so painful that you wish you'd never started on that. Mm. For us, I take great enjoyment in working with small to medium-sized business owners. So these are people with businesses that are doing less than 30, 35 million pounds a year. So we'll start at around one or two. That's really where the sweet spot starts to emerge. And this is where people are starting to hit glass ceilings. Uh, and that's where they've grown the business so much, but everyone just feels like they're treading water and can't grow the business any further. Mm. Uh, and it becomes a real struggle uh, at that point. That's where we can make a real difference to people. And it really does make a difference to myself and the other consultants and analysts when we speak to entrepreneurs and business owners who say, oh, can I actually go on holiday now? I mean, how many business owners really want to go on holiday? There aren't many. 
not because we just don't like holidays, but because we just don't really dare to step away because all of the processes are in our heads and all of our employees' heads. Nothing's written down, really. Uh, and there's certainly no automation in place. And that's a real big problem. And when we come back to the other point you raised, which is this one million businesses, how are we going to do it? Well, the answer is actually, I don't know. How do we do that at scale? I really don't know. And that is something that we need to and are challenging ourselves on how do we achieve that? And it does really make us have to lay bare our own processes and systems uh, and try and understand how we would scale something like that without sacrificing the, the level of referral that we get from client to client, because that really is our North Star of business. How strong are our referrals? And and you touched on something there that I wanted to ask anyway, which was and my curiosity runs away with me when I think of automation and I think of someone that's working in an automation orientated company. And so I wanted to know behind the scenes at Lollico, what kind of automation do you have in place that you look to that makes your life a lot easier? What things do you look look at in your business and think, oh, I'm so glad we have that kind of running on autopilot or semi-automated because it makes your life so much easier? Uh, so there are a number of things. So we can look at a few different areas. Uh, for instance, finance. There is a really good book out there called Profit First, and it, it sounds very Wolf of Wall Street. It's not. Really, the, the principle is, quite simply, uh, that when money comes into your bank account, you should be subdividing that between a number of different bank accounts, each reserved for a different thing. Mm -hmm. So that might be VAT, PAYE, might be you know operating expenses. It could be a number of different things, right? Uh, now, when you work it out as a UK business owner, you're likely probably looking at 10 different bank accounts. Now, moving money from your main bank account to 10 other bank accounts every single time uh, and then dealing with the bookkeeping on that is real pain. So that is something that I just personally automated. So as soon as the money hits the main account, it's split on a percentage basis between all the other accounts uh, and then within our bookkeeping software, it's automatically reconciled. So I don't have to do any of that, which is quite nice. Uh, that's a very nice way of doing it because you can really then start to focus away from worrying too heavily uh, on the cash flow side of business. There are other automations uh, that we have in place, of course, you know, we're always constantly looking for whether or not there may be a PR opportunity. So we're constantly scanning Twitter for any certain hashtags uh, and throwing those into Slack. Uh, the same with um, help a reporter out, Harrow, uh, which, as you know, is a PR uh, newsletter that's sent out from um, from journalists. And they kind of bring all these expert sources together. And hopefully you're on those resources so that if, for example, you are on the lookout for a journalist who's looking for cat experts, well, your Slack will automatically give you an alert when one of those emails come in, which is very handy. So you have to keep reading the, the epic emails they send three times a day. Uh, and then we do a lot of work actually with, um, as you would imagine, uh, our, our monitoring of our systems that we build for clients and our automation because we're constantly integrating different APIs. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar with that, that's an asynchronous programming interface, which really just means instead of what you and I would click in software, code just speaks to what's behind that front screen. Uh, so we're constantly taking a view on, is it still alive? Is it still up? Are there any problems? Because as soon as something like that goes down, it could have a cascading effect onto clients. And we need to be very much um, on the case when those types of things happen, uh, very proactive in, in solving them. So there's a lot of constant monitoring of those types of automations going on with us. Um, and then personally, I actually quite like automating different things around my office. Uh, if you were here in the winter, Scott, you would be pleased to know that before we came out to the office at 8 a.m. in the morning, uh, that we can turn on the heater, the lights, and all the other bits and bobs that we need to be on before we get out here for half an hour in the morning, which is quite helpful. As well as I actually managed to locate in, I, I think they come from, I'm going to say Singapore, but it's a company called Cedars S E triple e d r s and they basically backward engineered amazon alexa the, the the speaker and the same with the google one um and you can receive the board directly from them so i've been working on making my own um ai for that or or, or smart assistant uh, which is quite fun uh, who can control all of those things and, and control a few things for the kids as long as they say please and thank you which is quite good that's really funny because I was going to ask you, is there anything that stands out to you? It could be business or personal that you've kind of got in your back of your mind that you'd love to automate and you you kind of could visualize how it could work, but you just haven't got around to it yet. Yeah, actually, no, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the locking of my office door. It sounds so silly. But 
I might, I'm lucky enough in, in our garden, the bottom of the garden, we've got like a really, really super narrow, but super long garden. Um, so it's about 200 foot to the bottom of the garden. But the problem is it's, it's a converted shed. I'm saying it right now. And every night when I leave the office, I lock the door, go in, put the key on the side of the kitchen and, and, and carry on in the evening. But every single morning I get down to the office, to only remember. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to, rig up a, a, a bolt basically on the inside to unlock with not huge success at the moment but i'm sure i can get there because the only problem is if you get it wrong and the bolt shuts then uh you'll be smashing the window to get in which would be not ideal it's so funny because when we're talking through this and i'm smiling and laughing because uh, some of these things like as you i think you said yourself it seems silly or trivial and sometimes they do but once you now automations of these things at home whether it again whether it's personal and office orientated uh, or whether it's business related, once you now an automation of something and it's fully working, you get a real satisfaction out of that, and the seamlessness that it, the seamlessness that seamlessness that it builds into your life can just be really satisfying. I feel. Do you find the same thing? Oh, absolutely. If you ask my wife though; she says I was a nerd. <laughs> it's I, t- I take great joy in being able to turn the the heater on from a two hundred <laughs> meter distance. That's that's good fun, but. Yeah, I, I think there is a real satisfaction to it. I think there's a real uh, kind of eureka mm. in a child moment when you get these things to work. And, and I think that there is a real automating something with code on your computer screen is good. But when you do something that's physical, there's a real feel of magic to that, which is great. And there's some really cool things you can buy off the shelf, which will you know allow you to dial into them to do all these things. Brilliant. We might come back to that as we get towards the end of that episode. But I want to carry on a point that you were talking about just a moment ago. We were talking about, you were saying about, um, I think, where to start and how you started. And you were talking about the books that you go on, on Amazon and buy all of the books related to business processes that you could. So assuming that that's step one and you, you gain that knowledge, what frameworks or processes have been useful for you over the years to understand you know, how to best prioritize automations within a business. And maybe a way for me to rephrase this is if someone comes to you and says, I feel like my business is inefficient, but I don't really know where to start. Where where do you typically start with them? Where did that conversation go? So there's really uh, a three-step process. So we have this quite a lot. So our, our business is really divided between what we call process workshops uh, and then really business automation, because a lot of the time people come to us and they'll say, this is exactly the task I need to automate. And I know exactly where the problem is. That's that's one type of client. The other type of client, like you've just described, comes to us and says, it's all a bit of a mess. I'm not sure what's going on, but no one seems to be getting anywhere. We're just treading water. We can't seem to grow. So when you're looking at solving your processes, this three-step kind of process, I suppose, uh, is really what you want to do is you want to, first of all, don't get carried away and excited. First thing you've got to do is map out the processes as they are right now. Right? No cheating. Don't try and you know second guess yourself or, or jump forwards. Actually, as it is, and have put everyone together. Let's say you've got a team of five people in marketing. Let's say yeah, like SEO in SEO, right? Let's get all of those people together and let's map out all the processes that everyone does. But importantly, let's map it out as everyone individually does right now, because I would likely guess that the head of SEO imagines the process is done one way whilst the very junior doing a lot of the heavy lifting data entry those types of boring bits is likely doing it a different way and that's what we call normalization deviance where it seemed normal but people have deviated away now that is the new normal so we need to map that out first is it right exactly where we are and we need to then look at how much is that costing us as a company per hour for that one task for whoever does it and we need to time log each single task within that then once we've done all of that we can then get a good idea of our cycle cost so how long does it take us our cycle time to complete it Uh, and then what is our cost associated with that cycle at that point we then want to go into what we call an optimization point and this optimization point the idea being that we're going to now look at well where can we actually trim out some of the the fat here so for instance a good example is i've sat in process mapping situations before where it's come to light that someone receives some information in, they'll put it into a spreadsheet, print it out, take it upstairs to someone else's desk, who will then transfer them to an email and send it on to someone else. You will be amazed where you find these things, uh, and it just becomes normal. And everyone says, well, this is the way we've always done it. 
So let's now optimize that and let's look at some off the shelf type of tools that are really quite simple. Things like IFTTT, which is if this, then that, or something like Zapier, which is the same type of thing. These allow you to put, take one tool, tie it with another. So for instance, uh, let's say we get a new email subscriber, let's add that to a spreadsheet, something really quite simple. So let's see if we can solve a few problems there. Now, the very next step, the third step is, well, what would happen if we now automated that if we can somehow manage to get a cost onto the of what it would take us to produce this automation? If we now look at that over a year, that original task for how much time we had allocated to it in the cycle, is that going to give us a return on investment? Because if so, we should automate it now, right now, because it's just costing us money otherwise. That makes a lot of sense. And on the flip side of that, through your experience, either with companies that have come to you or just things that you've seen out in the wild, what are some of the pitfalls where maybe someone's started with automation and lost faith because something hasn't worked? Or maybe they've just approached automation with the either the wrong mindset or a, or a mindset that's not conducive to getting the best out of off-the-shelf automation kind of tools and processes. A wrong approach. There's two wrong approaches. The first is Rome wasn't built in a day. So people often will get carried away and they will map out this elaborate plan to automate loads of stuff in this one area of the business. And they will then spend the next six months to a year trying to make all of the custom development for this. It will then come off the end of this conveyor belt from their developers only for the developers to then realize, oh, the business has changed. The rules are different to how we once thought they were. And we're back to square one. But now we've got a massive bill. Instead, we should be serving automation a bit like sushi, one piece at a time. So like when we go to uh, uh, Yo Sushi, other sushi restaurants are obviously available, uh, that, that comes around the conveyor belt and you can pull a dish up one at a time. I don't, I don't know that there are. I think I only know Yo Sushi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. You can pull a dish off one at a time. Uh, and, and that's really the way we want to treat that type of automation. And that, that's absolutely important to do that because your business will change over time. Um, the requirements will change. Uh, and you cannot, even though you think you know what the process is going to be over the next six months to a year, it's likely going to change. So just don't try and do everything all at once. The other thing that we often see is uh, that people seem to have a really wrong viewpoint that automation is meant to replace employees. It is really not meant to replace your employees. No one rings up a bank and says, oh, if only I could speak to a robot. When was the last time that happened? Like, the, the point of it is, is that we're meant to really free up our employees to go back to actually doing things that they're good at, as in creative things. Humans are really great at being generalists. We're really, we find it really easy to switch between one role to a next really, really quickly, in a click of our fingers. Uh, machines are awful at this. It just creates ridiculous situations. I mean, you couldn't ask, you know, some machine learning that was built to play chess to suddenly then play ping pong. Just, just won't get it. I mean, it just won't even understand the rules. It would not even know where to start. And the same applies for any type of automation. So really what you want to do is you, you really want to focus your employees now back toward your clients, uh, back toward your customers. Because if you can increase the level of service that you're giving to them, you're only going to get more business. Uh, and I think that's the real secret in automation. Uh, and there's nothing wrong, actually, uh, in starting to think about maybe we should drop down to a four-day work week and attract even better employees in the future. Do you think there's maybe, a, and I am generalizing, but maybe a misconception then that automation is is fast to get started with? Because you can use If That Then This or Zapier, and mm -hmm. you can set up an automation very quickly. But the time-intensive part, to make sure that automation has some longevity for you is actually making sure that you spend the time up front in the planning process. Do you think that part's undervalued? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, no one ever talks about the boring part of processes, do they? It's not, yeah. not very sexy, is it? Process mapping. <laughs> it's not going to, you know, set the light of the world on fire doing that. But it's a really important point. I mean, it, you know, they don't really like to discuss these things, the automation tools, because it's quite boring. Mm. Um, but you know, if you go away and you take, let's say, 20 of your processes and you add some layers of automation through them, by the time you finish the last one, if you can tell me the exact process of the first one off the top of your head, I'd be amazed. You need a map. You need, you need a guide for all of these things. 
every business should have a process map and a standard operating procedure for every single process within the company. And if you don't have that, you are really just, you're, you're, you're working at risk is the thing. And this is why you feel like you can't go on holiday and why everything feels a bit foggy in your brain and you feel quite stressed. We all, aside from the general stress of business, of course, but we all feel a lot less stressed when, for instance, if you've got loads to do, Scott, I would imagine if you write everything down into a list, you feel much better. Mm. And that's exactly the same with the entire business and the processes. Yeah. If you have an employee where all the processes are in their head uh, and God forbid they get COVID and they're really seriously ill, and you need to bring someone in to replace them, what are you going to do? Because the, it's, the procedure's not there, and not only are you risking you know, your business, you're risking their job, and you, you just put, creates an impossible situation. Mm, that's really interesting because it leads into a question that I came into this with today was, are there any non-obvious benefits to learning automation skills? And so you spoke earlier about kind of releasing your inner child, and when I think of automation, I get quite excited, geeky, and I think of the, I guess I think of efficiency and productivity, but I also think about curiosity and creativity. And I think those are some of the non-obvious skills, the non-obvious benefits, sorry, of learning automation. But you've just touched on one really interesting there, which is actually just peace of mind. And oh, I, yeah. I think that's a, a huge aspect of automation, which yeah, maybe um, goes under the radar. It's It can be very relaxing to know that you have systems in place that are operating in the background that are, you know, it could be whether it's helping you manage risks in a business or as I've just mentioned, um, helping your business run more efficiently or seamlessly. seamlessly. All of those are benefits and perhaps non-obvious immediate benefits to automation. Are there any others that come to mind to, for you? Um, that's a really good question. I'll tell you one thing that comes to mind for me as you're, as you're thinking through is that do you think that learning automation software and skills, even if this, then that, and Zapier, do you think that can kind of be a launch pad for other forms of learning? Yeah, I think it can, right? I mean, those those are real entry points into automation and there are, there are other systems out there that become hugely complex beyond this. Um, but I think, and it's one thing that we recommend people do in our workshops, whether or not they're tech savvy or not, IFTT is a way for us to get them excited about automation. So we ask them mm. to go away and automate something from their own lives, um, whether or not people are coming in the next day and they're, they're, they're really pleased that now if it's going to rain, they get a text message or a Slack message. Right. They're completely chuffed. Um, you know, that's, that's a good way to do it. But I think that having the skill to automate things um, can be a great benefit. And I think that it's likely to emerge really as a, as a new role within companies within operations. Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting way to look at it. I haven't seen it yet as I'm looking around in the marketing industry, but I completely agree with you. I see that on the horizon because um, as you've just said, I think that well, you just mentioned the barrier to entry i think with if that uh, if i always get this wrong if this then that or if that <laughs> then this um since that came onto the that since that became more popular and then zapier and integromat and tools tools like that have become the barrier to entry to tools like that have they've become more accessible then um yeah i feel like all businesses as, are looking at that as an option as as you said it could become a key component within operations but on that topic about barrier to entry and entry level tools um you've met you've mentioned if this and that you've mentioned zapier i just mentioned integromat are there any others that you recommend or you'd recommend to friends or again peers if they're going if they're foraying into their first kind of ventures in automation and workflow software where, where should they start uh yeah sure absolutely um one of one of my favorite tools out at the moment is a tool called um, Trade.io, oh, yeah. um, which is very good. It potentially can be more advanced for some people, um, but the type of automation that it allows you to do is, is quite incredible. There are other um, automation tools that you can look at as well. And automation is being built into a lot of different systems now. So whether or not that's something like Monday.com, uh, where you can actually automate the workflow of your processes, whether or not there's something like process street where you can actually create all of your standard operating procedures within it and also automate things off of the back of that those are really good places to start uh, and i'd really encourage people to potentially start with something like process street in order to automate how those processes flow and monday.com as well 
and then start to look to layer on things like trade or IO. The Zapiers and the IFTTTs of this world are applicable to business, but there's only so far you can take them. You know, you might get to two or three connections from them, but things can start to feel a bit messy when you start to map them there. So I think that's somewhere that I would 100% advise people to start. You mentioned right at the beginning about machine learning and AI, and that's kind of beyond the theme that we're discussing today, which is more simple or getting started with business automation. But I was really interested from my perspective, I still feel like accessibility to machine learning and AI is maybe a little out of reach for people that aren't technically savvy. So maybe there's still a little bit of a barrier to entry, although it's getting less and less. Uh, Have you seen any tools or any services that are lowering that barrier to entry for AI and ML and using that within businesses? Um, so I mentioned trade.io earlier on, and, and, and I've also mentioned APIs. And trade.io is good because you can connect one API to another. Now, classically, the way that machine learning and AI has worked is that it's really been internal tools that people have built, their own machine learning, their own AI. But we're starting now to come across tools by companies like OpenAI. And there's a new tool they've got. It's been out for a while now called GPT-3, very catchy name. But the point of GPT-3, and it's, it's actually backed by one of the main guys who was previously in Y Combinator and actually Elon Musk as well, is that it is an incredible uh, piece of kit for what we call natural language processing. So if you gave it, let's say, 100 lines of Harry Potter or 100 sentences or paragraphs, it would likely spit you out something that was very, very close to Harry Potter. It was actually trained uh, they say on 10% of the internet, which is a huge amount of, of data for it to read and crunch. But what's really, really cool and I think sets the scene for and, and really the pace for other uh, machine learning and AI systems going forwards is that GPT-3, you cannot get access to its to its, its back end. So you can't get access to the data behind it. But what you can do is you can call it over an API. So you send it the data over an API and it returns to you other data over an API which then means you can build that into these automation tools like Trade.io. That is something that hasn't really been done much over the last few years, uh, but I think it's going to become more and more common actually as we go forwards. So we're going to start to see more um, models, more different different types of machine learning uh, and AI come to the forefront where you can actually call it over uh, API. And they, they, they're out there, right? And you can, you can do this whether or not they're Google-based, Google products, whether they're Microsoft products, Amazon, or, or, or GPT-3. It's really quite um, quite an interesting play that now this is going down. And leading on from that, I wanted to close out this episode with your favorite examples of automation that you, you've either helped businesses implement or that you've seen out in the wild through maybe friends or peers and there's something interesting that I, I found in your website copy. You talk about obviously helping businesses with all of, all of the things that you've discussed today. But there was a line that I really liked, which says um, to help build an automated side hustle that one day could become your own full-time business, which really speaks to true to that kind of entrepreneurial spirit you were discussing when you were working at a previous job and trying to automate things. And I'm just interested to start there. I recently came across a company called Swag Up, and they're a US-based company that offers business or corporate merchandise, and they were entirely built off of automation software. I think they earned their first few million in revenue purely from processes that were built in Zapier. And that blew me away when I found out about their story. Do you have any stories like that uh, that you've seen people build their side hustles that have either built them passive income or have eventually turned into their full time businesses? Uh, I think looking at as this is a digital marketing based podcast, let's kind of look in that let's look in that realm. So people working in SEO often have a huge amount of tasks that they need to they need to do on a daily basis and data to crunch. Uh, and it can become very expensive as well, the things they do. So for instance, let's say you are trying to look after a number of clients. There are a number of keywords that you need to track. Now, there are tools out there to do that. There's things like Ahrefs. Where every three days, it will give you your volume data again you know, and your ranking data, which is great, and it works really, really well. Uh, and there are uh, other tools out there like AccuRanker who can give you your, your rankings as well. But what happens if you're trying to, rank, trying to uh, track a million keywords? The price becomes insane. 
Uh, and then what happens if you want to start tracking competitors? So we had a client who came to us with this exact problem. So there are APIs out there that, that allow that to be called. So we send it the, the keyword. We built a custom tool for him. We send the keywords to this API. It returns the data. We store it in BigQuery. And he's then able to actually leverage um, business intelligence tools to chart all of this, to not only track his own keywords for his business, but track every other business that ranks for those same keywords and then start to see uh, ranking movements within Google to get a good understand of like an industry weather vane, if you will, so that if his domains drop, he's able to see the the actual patterns in the data for what emerges and he gets to see everything. So whether or not that's organic search, whether or not that's uh, what's coming up in paid um, or, or any type of packs, he can see the whole thing. So that, that's a really good example of of leveraging that in order so that he can then sell on his ranking, rank tracking, uh, but actually make decent profit out of it whilst before it would be really a disbursement that you'd have to pass on and make zero profit from. And there are plenty of other examples like that too, where you know we're working with with clients who are wanting to smash data together in different ways in order to find competitive analysis on uh, keywords or whether or not that's a particular client who was interested in us helping them build domain sniping tools, which would not only pull up domains that were going through auction at the moment, whether or not it's GoDaddy or another domain name auction supplier, but we'd actually layer on top of that SEO data from SEMrush, Moz, and Ahrefs in order to get a good idea of spam scores or volume scores or how difficult it would be to actually rank that against other keywords and other domains, which was quite interesting. So there's a number of different applications you can provide. And a lot of these things, these examples that I give, they start off as small tools that someone's using internally. And they start to realize, actually, if I could put a billing section on this, and if I could put a login system and a registration system, suddenly this turns into a product that I can now sell. Uh, And that is all too common in, in what we do with clients. Yeah, it's funny, as you were talking, uh, what came to mind is exactly what you've just said. Um, It's, you know, small personal tools that are customizable for the situations that you're facing are likely going to be faced by other people. It's not too much effort to eventually then turn them into SaaS products. And that journey makes a lot of sense. And is one that I'm seeing a lot more common these days. And just on the more business front for you, are there any businesses that you've helped at Lolly Code that you can speak to, maybe provide some examples for our listeners, just how you've helped revolutionize their business through automation. Just any favorite examples that come to mind? A good example um, would be, there's a company called Opulize, my favorite eyewear provider, obviously is my client. They produce glasses, uh, like distance glasses or reading glasses. Uh, and when I first met them, that was back just at the start of COVID actually. And they were going through some hyper growth. Um, And one of the core problems that they've had is trying to get an idea of stock prediction, which can be very, very difficult. They have, uh, I believe, 15,000 SKUs, uh, which is a lot for an e-com company, um, and they're producing them all themselves. So transporting those halfway across the world and trying to predict sales trends upcoming, uh, as well as Amazon large orders being dropped to them become very, very complex. Um, So crunching data, tracking shipments, tracking air freights and working all into a a ginormous sales and stock prediction system uh, was really, really vital for them, uh, as well as automating the pick and packing within the warehouses themselves uh, and trying to understand optimal delivery. Um, So that's a really good example. Another good example uh, is is an accountancy firm, which I can't can't mention the name of. Um, However, with accountancy firms, one of the largest things that none of us really realize when we're not accountants is that the majority of their time is spaced chasing stuff. I mean, how many times have we all had our, our accountant chase us for you know, our, our tax return or our, our tenants again, oh, your VAT's due, please send in all your receipts or you know, X, Y, and Z. We get it from them every single month. But imagine being an accountant and you've got 500 clients and then <laughs> the next department has they got another 500. And this, this, this accountancy firm's got tens of thousands of clients. So it became a real big problem. Um, so automating the chasing up of all of these documents and even in some circumstances, filing these documents automatically uh, into companies' house and HMRC from what would seem to the end user for their client, uh, a simple you know, couple of clicks and a couple of form fill outs was revolutionary to their business. Uh, it speeds things up dramatically for them. Uh, those are some really good examples. And 
before I let you go, so I've had a sneak peek into the first chapter of your upcoming book, Upgrade. But do you want to give our listeners a yeah, maybe a sneak peek of what to expect from the book when it's released in August later this year? Yeah, absolutely. So Upgrade really is meant to be a guide for the rest of us, as I call it. So typically, this is for us business owners who potentially aren't as technology advanced as as others, you know, who aren't from Silicon Valley, who don't have developers in house, and it's meant to be there to help you understand how to orientate your processes in the right direction, how to look to start your automation, whether or not it's off the shelf custom uh, off the shelf software, or whether or not it's custom software you're having developers build for you, which will guide you on, and finally even how to layer in business intelligence. You can use data to make data led decisions. Those are really important points um, that I kind of hold your hand and take you through uh, in order to make you more money, really, is the game. And so if our listeners want to find out more about that book, more about Lollico and more about you, where can they find you? Uh, If you head to our website, lolly.co, there you will find uh, all the information about our company and the book. Uh, And you're welcome to follow me uh, on Twitter at I'm Daniel Cooper. Thanks so much, Daniel, for your time today. I've really enjoyed hearing some of those examples that you've shared. And I know that I'm going to be, well, hopefully you let me know when you solve that problem with your shed, because I know that's going to be satisfying. <laughs> I want to make, I want to know how you figure that one out. And I know that's going to bring some joy to your life. So I hope you get that sorted soon. Uh, right. Thanks so much for your time today. Uh, for our listeners, anything that we've discussed today will be in the show notes. And this has been the Internet Marketing Podcast. Cheers, Daniel. Thanks very much.